Well, it's amazing being here. Um, Particularly as our country at the moment, it sort of feels like we're locked in a, in a shed surrounded by World War II memorabilia. <laughs> you know, with the Philip Schofield story piped in for a little bit of live entertainment. <laughs> you know, with a whole bunch of frauds governing us and, uh, you know, just being used as just ambition pap. You know, I, I just wish when the whole Brexit thing was being discussed, we had someone like Franklin Delano Roosevelt in charge, right? Who would have gone to the people and said, it's not Brexit you want, but I understand what is making you think this way. I understand why you're so desperate that you even, and you know it would be the case, you even want to trade in your jobs, your prosperity, your whole industrial future just to have some kind of change because you're on zero hours contract. I used to take our cats at 7 p.m. on the Sunday night and do my first delivery at 4 in the morning in Birmingham and deliver to all the restaurants in London before 12, sleep in the service stations on the way back, and then I was at, at sea Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I'd do it again until we got a driver to do it and this, that, and the other. But in those truck stops at 4 in the morning at the bull ring and the fish market, I met the people who were the backbone of Brexit, and they were desperate, they were ignored, they were angry, and the tragedy is we had these ambitious sons of bitches come into power who saw this as an opportunity to get their seats into, get their asses into power. And I find, I find that such a distressing thing to see. Instead of a great politician, a Delano Roosevelt, who would have come forwards and said, you know what, we need a new deal. We need a new deal. We don't need to da-da-da. Um, coincidentally, one of the uh, guys I used to Dived with on my boat for a very long time, an old veteran from the well-known fishing port of Bradford, um, <laughs> uh, who was blind in one eye, a guy called David Stinson, the ultimate sort of Yorkshire Uber man. And I never forget one saying to him, Didi, how do you manage to find scallops down there? You know, you've got one eye missing. And he went, Guy, I do believe that I am psychic. And I was like, right. And then later on, we spoke about Brexit, and uh, he's a total rampant Brexitarian. Uh, and I have talked to him recently about the fact that I think his psychic ability kind of let him down on that one. <laughs> anyway, I could go on, but let, let me, I just wanted to start with um, a, a short film that I'd like you to see, and I'll explain why afterwards, if you don't mind. There's an old saying which I really love. We have many lives to lead before we die. And I think my days as a scallop diver are coming to an end. These waters have taught me how to be humble and to know when it's time to walk away. It feels really good to go for a dive with Luke and to be carrying my scallop net with no real intent because I've got a feeling I'm going to be putting it away forever. Cook our day's catch simply, and there's no better way to cook incredible shellfish. But I never get over the feeling of luck in my life to have had this chance to learn the skill of diving for scallops and to learn and find my way around places like this. Boys, how's it all been? It's been Absolutely amazing, start to finish. It's been an incredible journey. So many places, seen so many things. It is amazing traveling by boat, actually, isn't it? If you think about it, we've been to so many different places just west of Scotland. But that's freedom. There's one road on Earth, and it connects everything. It's the sea. The Atlantic is such an adventurous place. 
I was inspired to make this journey for Oscar and Luke. Without doubt, my greatest achievement on Earth is to say that these boys are my sons. Who knows where they will go in life? But I'm certain they'll never forget where they came from. So what that was about was kind of very important in many ways to me. Because for a long time, we started this business. <clears throat> and it became a very strong business. We started with the smallest registered fishing boat in Scotland, which was a six meter rib. And uh, I dived all year round on that. And I started with two difficult old scallop divers. I never forget the first day I said to them, what's it going to be like? And Liam Griffin said, fierce, too ferocious. But coming at times, unbearable. You know, I was like, <laughs> fuck. And I dropped down onto the, swam down to the seabed, and I swam through black, dark, dark. Didn't, you don't see the seabed until it hits you. And I remember sitting there and waiting for my eyes to get used to the mark. And it was just another wilderness. It was exactly the same as the wilderness which I lived in the interior of Alaska when I built a cabin there when I was in 2005. And I lived 300 miles to the nearest road, and I got around by dog team, and I hunted and trapped for my, the part and everything. But I learned then the danger of pride, that proud people in great big wilderness zones, be they natural or commercial, will die frozen on a mountain. And I learned to fear pride and proud people and I uh, became an expert, devout coward at sea. I just, I was, you know, just so good at running away and hiding. You just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. And so Honda Marine came to me and they said, you know, because we were doing 10,000 scallops a week to our market. And at the same time, we were also fighting to get 30 marine protected areas put into Scotland. We were fighting that never-ending tide of greed, uh, which is out-of-control capitalism, not capitalism, out-of-control capitalism, backed up by politicians whose only currency was votes. And why the storytelling is so important is because everything that was going on in the marine environment was going on under a blue. You couldn't see it. And so it was all the debates, that the issues that were dominating the debate were all entirely sociological in Britain. You know, because we couldn't see what was going on. And so the great British class system was being utilized by the working men who are impoverishing the working men. And anyone who spoke about environmentalism or protecting the environment was by their very nature, privileged, abstracted, North London, guardian reading, observerites, da 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 da, you know? So uh, it was uh, you know, only by starting to tell stories that showed that this, this can be different, that we had a, a great deal of success in getting 30 marine protected areas they're still dredged at three in the morning, etc. Don't, don't, don't think they're perfect. We managed to stop all the wild kelp being dredged in Scotland, uh, which was involved us having to tell a counter story to the large chemical company that was about to get the contract to dredge the kelp. Who they had rebranded kelp dredging, right? They were going to dredge 15,000 miles of coastline. They'd rebranded it as kelp combing. So you had to go in and tell a counter story. And the best way to do it was to start with a joke and to say, listen, we, did, we, we went in and spoke to the MSPs before they went into the vote. And we said, unless MBL are planning a 15,000 mile side parting, I think we've got an issue here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then we started and thankfully that didn't, that came through. But anyway, so Honda came through and they wanted Honda Marine and they wanted to tell a story about starting an ethical shellfish company and everything that was involved with it. And ethical was nailed because Brexit came along. And we had never wanted to export. We wanted to only do business in the UK because we wanted to culturally understand who we were dealing with. And so we went from 10,000 scallops a week. And it was a hard business to build. And we made a profit from the first year. And it went to zero in three days. Um, and uh, it, you know, the, the children had grown up with it and experienced it, and it was part of their this, that, and the other. And so I said to Honda, yeah, I will make it, but I need, this to, I need to do it in a way that uh, I want to mark the fact that 
things end. We're all talking here about starting stuff, right? But let me tell you one of the most important things that any entrepreneur can do, that anyone can do, is learn to end things well, as well. To not run from them, to actually really work at how you end something correctly. So I wanted to end, this is part of our saying goodbye to the Ethical Selfies Company, that we wanted to make a film that captured the love that we have for the sea and the environment and the love that I have for my sons and, and the importance, you know. Of, of, and it was important for them too to, in a sense, bury the brand. <clears throat> and so we did that. And, uh, I mean, the, the, the filming was exhausting. We drank way too much on the boat. Was, uh, I, you can see I look like Jeremy Clarkson. I was just fucking worn out. <laughs> but, uh, you know... Um, but it was a really, it was a, it was a good moment, and it really did get me thinking about this. You know, here we are now, just thinking about um, how to end stuff. You know, and and to preserve the people around you, to preserve what you built, the memory of it, the value of it, to preserve yourself. You know, a, a, in order to make a tilth, to plant the next seeds, and it can't be full of rocks and pebbles and weeds of regret and disaster and. It's got to be a clean tilth that you've made yourself. You've taken time to bury and say goodbye to something. And so that was the, the big one there. Um, and it, it, it has made a, a profound difference to how we've all moved on. And it's, it's given us food, tremendous amount of, of food as well, uh, spiritually speaking. And then I was also thinking about, you know, the things that, propel us to, to do stuff, you know, the dreams, the dreams that we have. And I've followed dreams. And what I'm so interested about with dreams is <clears throat> the way they take you to a, a, a reality, don't they, that you, you couldn't have planned for or couldn't have dreamed for. But the dreams got you there. If you hadn't had the dream, you wouldn't have landed up getting that marrow out of that bone. So that, that dream propels you. And what I've always found fascinating, and I've followed these dreams without any money behind me, so I've been completely unsupported. So when I went to, I'd always had a dream of living in the deep wilderness in the interior of Alaska, right? And uh, the dream in the end propelled me, and I found myself in a reality which I could never have predicted. And it was unique. It was the gold of the adventure. It was the pith. It was the piece of originality that I could never have expected. And then, you know, and you can apply this to business too. I just learned the unbelievable importance of carrying through the old English saying, which is, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. <laughs> I'm such a believer in that. You know, it's fall on your ass, fail. Just, just that. I'm telling you the stuff you know already, Okay. But that was, a, that was a particular truism that really, really, really helped me. And then another one I learned at sea was just never, when I brought him, I then laterally we went and I managed to write a couple of books and I did a bit of TV stuff and we managed to get a bit of money together. And uh, we bought a second-hand boat off the coast of Venezuela. And uh, I got a book deal and I got a, a, a thing for the Sunday Telegraph. And the boys were four and seven. And we just went and lived at sea. I had a day skipper license. And we bought this 50 miles off the Venezuelan coast. Anyway, long story short, what was so wonderful about it was just seeing how, how it changed the children. So the youngest one, he was standing behind me there when I was putting on my dry suit. I'll never forget, he was once taking us across a, a harbour in Trinidad. And he was going too fast on the launch. And I just said, Luke, Luke, you really need to slow down. And he, he looked up at me and he said, Dad, um, I am actually four. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's like the, you know, so um, the, the experiences we had. And then I needed, to get, I needed to get the boat back. I did the maritime equivalent. We managed to get all the way up to New York, sailed into New York, which was the most ex incredible experience to go under the Verrazano Bridge and up the Hudson River, uh, which, by the way, Robert Kennedy Jr., who's running for president, as you know, and has only been able to raise $4 million because everyone fucking hates him, big pharma, uh, everyone who's involved in that greed tide can't stand him. 
But just as an aside, he saved the Hudson. The Hudson was so polluted, it was actually bursting into flame in the early 80s. It was burning. And Robert Kennedy Jr., for 40 years, he was an environmental advocate, advocate and lawyer, took each and every one of those polluters to court and had each and every one of them sued. He then set up the River Keepers, which was an organization to keep rivers, where you know, people would specifically guard stretches of river. The Hudson River, which I had the honor to sail up, which is now full of striped bass and every kind of fish you can imagine, has got the highest biomass of any river entering into the North Atlantic, thanks to that man's work. I'm so impressed. 69 um, and lovely. But of course, we don't know what's going to happen with him. Anyway, sailing to New York. Um, so I, at that time, Hurricane Bertha had turned up in the Caribbean, and I needed to get the boat back. I didn't want to bring the children across. So I found a, uh, a we we'd made friends with a guy in the boat yard in Trinidad. He was a 68-year-old um, diabetic, old-school, cantankerous old guy. And uh, he agreed to come across with me. And my plan was to outrun the hurricane. Uh, because I, I thought if I headed for cold water, the hurricane would slow. I'm just talking to you about how heading from A towards B doesn't always work. And I thought that as I got into the colder waters, the hurricane would slow down, you know, because cold water is a real decelerant for hurricanes. Anyway, we went 550 miles up to Halifax. We got up into the Labrador current, and it was all just pure fog and a huge wind. It was the wind blowing over the Arctic Labrador current. Then we got over the Flemish cap. We were feeling good. Past St. John's to port. We were charging ahead. And then 800 miles west of Ireland, that's why it's particularly poignant being here, Hurricane Bertha hit us and became the only hurricane to have ever tracked in the history of hurricanes into the North Atlantic. <laughs> so it's quite, it's quite nervous being on this particular coast because I do remember the sensation of being in seas that were so appalling that there was no wind and there was no light between the waves. Um, it's a very strange experience when all you hear is Then you're ripped right up that wave, and at the top, you're at 70 knots of wind and hurricane. Um, but we made it in the end, and we came to a small pub in Ireland. <laughs> and at 22 days later, and Davey and I walked. He was wearing a pair of shorts and a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops with a number of missing toes due to diabetes. So it's, a, it's an interesting look and a brave look. Um, and we walked in, and they, they said, where have you come from? And we said, Halifax. And they said, well, have you come down the, the, the North Sea? We went, no, 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 Nova Scotia. And they were like, oh, you know. So they gave us all free drinks. The Irish were just, you couldn't be with better people, right? And they were wonderful for that thing. And Davey raised his glass, and he said, a wise man once said... The road to wisdom can only ever be found through the gates of excess. <laughs> and it was just, and you know the Irish, they love them. They love Americans. Anyway, so yeah, it's, I'm just saying, I'm really talking there a little bit about that, the, the dreams, and I do believe that we have many lives to lead before we die. I think it's so important. And it's also important, too, to remember that we are flowers in the wind. We are flowers in the wind doesn't matter. Our lives are incredibly important, and at the same time, unbelievably unimportant in the great scheme of things. I would lie on the bottom of the seabed, on the seabed at 40 meters or whatever, creeping along like some odd crustacean, searching for scallops. If I surfaced, great. If I don't, there'll still be a tide every six hours and 50 minutes. When I dropped off planes, bush planes into the snow up to my waist and it was away and it was just me miles from anyone. It was such a relief to realize that I, no one gives a damn. I'm not going to beat the, I'm not going to win. I'm not going to triumph. I'm going to run away. I'm going to hide. <laughs> I'm going to, but I don't matter that much. And I think it's a really important thing to remember when you embark on the adventure, when you do make the dream happen, uh, there's a fine line that you can find. And I really recommend it, which is, so I fuck up. <laughs> is the world going to stop flowing? Da -da. Okay, what I have to do is make sure that 
if, I, if this is going to end, if this isn't going to work out as I want it to work, let me craft it as best as I can to find as much to guarantee my future and the, those around me. But other than that, just rejoice in the fact that we mean nothing. We're only here for five seconds. And it also tells you to... I used to meet people on the other side who were thinking of crossing, and they, they'd be looking out the far horizon on their boats, the whole keel flowing heavy with seaweed growth that has just accrued over the years. And they go, they go, how's it going? They go, I'm just waiting to cross, waiting to cross, waiting for that weather, you know, that weather window. You know, go, go, learn uh, is a big one. So I think on the subject of boats and stuff, I'm going to take a terrible risk. I'm going to sing you a little song. <laughs> and my, my mom was, um, is uh, an 84-year-old woman from Naples. And uh, hard drinking, rolling beautiful cigarettes. And she's in a little attic flat in Tobermory on Mole. And uh, she uh, immigrated in 1948. My grandfather had been brought up by a Neapolitan Fagan. Had a whole bunch of kids who he kept as pickpockets and poker players. And my grandfather, Carlo Mercario, her father, was a brilliant gambler and became a great pucarazzi. And when he got a bit hot for him in Naples, he left. And he went just north into a small village where my great-grandfather, who I named after, Gaetano Ginex, saw him and immediately jailed him. You know, because he thought, I'm not going to have this fancy boy in my town. <laughs> Italy in Italy, his daughter fell in love. And then I think he was very grateful <clears throat> that he had such a clever son-in-law because Carlo set up 12 businesses and, uh, outside of Italy. And my mom left in 1948. She left Santa Lucia on the boat in the Bay of Naples. So I'm going to sing you the chorus of Santa Lucia. <clears throat> this is a risk. <laughs> Sul mare luccica Placida e l'onda prospero e vento Sul mare luccica l'astro d'argento Placida e l'onda prospero e vento Venita la gele barchetta mia, Santa Lucia, Santa Lucia.